Welcome, everybody, um, here at the Museum of uh, Science and the Cosmos of Tenerife, and also everyone watching on the internet. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, today, uh, it's, uh, for me, a, a great pleasure and a great honor um, to introduce John Lomberg. John Lomberg in uh, Hawaii. Aloha to you, John. It's a uh, good morning to you, I guess. Good morning, Hector. Um, I am not going to introduce John Lomberg. I've been thinking really hard this morning how I was going to do this, and I've decided I'm not going to introduce him. And let me explain the reason. The way I see it, there's, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's people who know who John Lomberg is and people who don't. So if you're in the first group, um, you don't need me to explain to you who John Lomberg is. And if you're in the second group, then you shouldn't be watching this. You shouldn't be here. Go, go watch some, something else. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But it will, it will take me so long uh, to, to really explain, um, to, to introduce John Lomberg, because he's, he's many, many different things. So I will just say a couple of things. Um, he was one of the creators of uh, Cosmos, uh, which uh, to me is like th the greatest thing ever done, okay? And um, it's, okay, it's my opinion, and I may be biased, but um, I'm willing to uh, defend that opinion. And um, he's an artist and a, a, a journalist, and he was part of the team that created Cosmos. And here at the museum, we are celebrating 40 years uh, of, uh, of Cosmos. And we have um, a beautiful exhibition right here next door um, where you can, you can see some of the artwork that John Lomberg produced as the chief artist of Cosmos. And, um, but he has also done many other things. And maybe during our conversation here, uh, some of these will, will come up. So um, thank you for being with us uh, tonight, uh, or this morning for you, John, from Hawaii. Uh, John is in, in Hawaii right now, in his beautiful home, uh, you can see uh, in that setting. And um, let me start asking you precisely about Cosmos and about uh, your friend, Carl Sagan, whom uh, you met in 1972. And you told me the story of uh, how you two guys met and I thought it was a, a very delightful and remarkable story. Uh, would you mind sharing it with our audience? Sure. Well, of course, I had heard of Carl long before he had heard of me. I had uh, read some of his scientific work about extraterrestrial life. And when he and his colleague Frank Drake and Linda Sagan made the famous plaques that were put on the Pioneer spacecraft, to me that was just so exciting. So I wrote him basically a fan letter. And I sent some of my artwork and I told him how much his work had affected me. And he wrote back and uh, suggested that we meet. I was living in Toronto at that time and he was going to be connecting on a flight in Toronto and said we could get together while he was waiting for his plane uh, to go back home. But he didn't tell me the flight number. Uh, and I didn't know what he looked like. So I realized, how was I going to find him? And in those days, you could go right up to the gates. There was no, uh, there was no security. So I started thinking about this talk about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, where the situation was very much the same. Here we are on Earth. We think there are other beings elsewhere. But how do we find them? How do we make a sign or how do we find a way that they can find us? Uh, and that's the problem that we haven't solved with extraterrestrial life. So I had to solve it with Carl Sagan. So the solution I thought of was to take a scientific equation. It was called the Drake equation, named after his colleague, Frank Drake. And it was an equation that had to do with a way to figure out 
much life there was in the universe. And I thought that in Toronto airport that day, the only person who would recognize the Drake equation would be Carl Sagan. So I put it on a piece of paper. I wrote it very large and put it on the outside of my art portfolio. And I simply stood in the airport and I let him find me. Many people walked past me and gave me looks. They didn't have any idea what I was trying to sell them. And finally, a tall man came over with a big smile on his face and said, that was a very clever way of finding me. So we started off on a good note like that. And uh, our friendship then continued for five years, right up until his death while we were working on the movie Contact. Mm -hmm. That's... Um yeah, I found that story very, um, very remarkable, and uh, I think it describes uh, very well uh, both you and, and Carl, and that you were able to meet that way. Um, I think you mentioned to me that at the time he was starting work on uh, the Cosmic Connection, and and that he um, invited you to to collaborate uh, on that book with him. Is is that correct? Yes, at that very first meeting, after we had spoken for an hour or so. He told me that just signed a contract to do what was his first book for a, a popular audience, The Cosmic Connection. The original title was The Cosmic Perspective, but the hit movie that year was The French Connection. So the publisher suggested that the title be changed to The Cosmic Connection, which was a good title because really what Carl tried to do in that book and in Cosmos and in everything else he did was to help people see the connection between themselves and the cosmos. So that was the first uh, book we worked on together. I did about a dozen pictures for that book and uh, we realized that we had a lot in common. We became very good friends. We enjoyed each other's company a lot. We laughed a lot. We talked about things that both of us were interested in, especially the idea of extraterrestrial intelligence. And we just decided that uh, we would continue working together, and we did. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I, I often say that one of the most um, important messages in Cosmos is the, um, the, precisely the cosmic perspective, the realization of uh, of how small we are, how fragile we are, and, and what is our place in this vast universe, but at the same time, how important we are, because we are the most exquisitely complicated thing that we know in the universe. And, and that's, I think, what, um, what it, the, the, the words cosmic uh, perspective, um, at least to me, that, that's what, uh, what um, uh, brings to, to my to my mind when I hear those words. So I, I find it very um, very suggestive that his first popular book, uh, he was thinking about calling it the the cosmic connection. Uh, sorry, the cosmic perspective, which I think is uh, is a very appropriate thing. Um, can you tell us something about um, his his personality? Like when when you got together at the airport, I can see that you you like coffee very much. Um, I can probably tell our audience some things about, about you, uh, because from the conversations that we have, from the interactions, uh, I can tell the, the audience here that John is, um, is a very uh, easygoing person, um, a very, um, I think, very cultivated, uh, very interesting person who knows uh, about many different things, uh, very interested in literature, art, science, and... Um, it seems to me that you are a person who, on the one hand, you are very rigorous about your work. You, you are very, um, y you want to make, uh, everything has to be uh, perfect and, and right uh, wh when you work. But at the same time, you are very open to uh, new ideas and suggestions. That's at least the um, impression that, I've, uh, uh, that I get uh, from you from our interactions over these past months. Um, I wonder if you could make a portrait like, well, I, I don't know if I, if I got the right picture or not. Uh, <laughs> maybe I got it completely wrong, everything. Um, you, can, you can correct me if that's the case. But I, I wonder if you could paint a similar uh, rough portrait of Carl uh, like that, because, you know, all of us, uh, we, we have seen 
um, his interviews, we see him in, in Cosmos, we've read his books, and maybe we wonder a little bit what he was like in, you know, in the close proximity that, that you had the, the opportunity to enjoy. Well, I would like to believe that the things that you said about me are true. I know they were true about Carl. He was at the same time extremely rigorous. If anything was about science, he wanted the science to be accurate. He had a clear distinction made between what we know and what we speculate. And it's very important not to confuse the two. And he was interested in everything. He was interested in history. He was interested in politics. He was interested in art. He taught genetics at Stanford. Uh, even in science, he was all over the map. In astronomy, there's a big distinction between the astronomers who study planets and the astronomers who study everything else outside the solar system. But Carl was in both worlds. He was interested in the galaxy and he was interested in the atmospheres of the planets. So I think his ability uh, is something everybody saw and also his ability to articulate, to uh, explain, to make it understandable and important to everybody else. But what I think people don't know about Carl is the kind of person he was. First of all, he was very funny. He could have had a career as a comedian. He could tell a story and have a whole room full of people just laughing. And he had had so many interesting experiences and met so many people and every story seemed to have a funny aspect to it. And his timing, he often talk about the importance of timing in comedy, and his timing was perfect. And in fact, when we were working on Cosmos and other projects, some of us often said to him, Carl, why don't you so show your humorous side, show people how funny you can be? But he always resisted that because he was usually talking about very serious subjects and he chose not to approach it humorously. But I often think he could have done Cosmos almost as a comedy show and it would have worked. So that's one of the reasons I enjoyed his company so much. He was just out to be with. He always had something to say. He always was, he was a wonderful person to watch television with when people were doing stupid things because his commentary on it was worth more than the program. The other thing that uh, I don't know if people know about him is what a great humanitarian he was. He was always a champion of social justice and human rights. Uh, in his department at Cornell, he was a champion of the rights of uh, gay scientists and uh, transsexual scientists when long before that was considered uh, an, an issue, a main he would support those people and uh, defend their rights to do science, whatever their personalities were like. Uh, and he was also uh, a great believer in peace and global unity, and he expressed that in political action. I don't know if many people know that he was actually arrested in protesting some of the United States government's uh, nuclear weapons policies. He was part of a group that went on to a test site to stop a nuclear test, and he was arrested for that. Uh, after Cosmos, when he kind of became the world's guru on he could have stayed there comfortably, but he risked his career and he caused a lot of people to turn against him because of his outspoken political views. He was a man of enormous personal courage. He also had tremendous health problems his whole life. Uh, just in the 25 years I knew him, he had three major crises uh, that almost killed him. But in, and the, the third one finally did kill him. But uh, in each of those, he responded with courage. Uh, he endured a great amount of pain and suffering without complaining. And uh, he was always a kind of a, an idol to me in, uh, in how a person should behave. Well, you have said uh, many things that I had no idea about. Um, and I'm sure many of the people who are watching uh, feel the same way. So, so thank you for that. And um, 
I was particularly surprised by your comments about his, uh, not, not only his sense of humor, but also his ability to make comedy, which are two, two separate things. I, I was not surprised to hear that he had a, a, a witty sense of humor, but that he was also able to express it in a way that, that could um, successfully um, uh, uh, you know, uh, act as a comedian for, for a crowd. Um, going back to Cosmos, do you remember, I mean, at the time, uh, you, you had known each other for, for a while, for a few years at least, uh, I guess, uh, since you met in 1972. Um, do you remember how the whole project uh, started, the first ideas? Um, I don't know, is, is it something that uh, Carl came up with, or was the, did he get the idea from some other people? Uh, how, do you remember any of that? Yes, well, it was the first television program that Carl wanted to do. Back in 1973, he was uh, working with a production company to make a program called Man and the Cosmos. And I worked on that with him and went all over the country looking at what at that time was the state of the art in computer graphics, which was very primitive. And uh, But that show was never produced, but it started in his mind thinking about how he would address these ideas on television. Then a few years after that, still before Cosmos, uh, the director, Francis Ford Coppola, the director of The Godfather, uh, wanted to make a uh, TV special with Carl. And the premise was it was going to be as if the program was interrupted with a live news bulletin. And the bulletin was we had just made contact with extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. And that would be the story. And it would run over several nights on television. And in order to explain about extraterrestrials, Carl would cover many of the same topics that we covered in Cosmos, the origin of planets, the origin of life, and things like that. So television was very much in his mind, but neither of those projects happened. Then in 1970, beginning of 1978, a television producer named Greg Andorfer uh, thought that Carl would be the perfect person to make a series on space uh, for PBS, the uh, uh, educational network in the United States. And uh, there had been a program on the BBC called The Ascent of Man that starred a famous anthropologist, Jacob Bernalski. And Greg Andorfer approached the producer of that series, Adrian Malone, who was one of the best documentary television producers, uh, and uh, asked him if he would be the producer, if Carl would be the writer and the presenter. So that was the origin of, uh, of Cosmos. It was really Greg Andorfer's idea, and he brought uh, Adrian Malone and Carl Sagan together. And uh, Carl mentioned it to me uh, early in 1978, must have been around January in 1978, when I saw him, and he said that this might be happening. And then I left uh, the country. I went actually traveling. I, this was after I had done the uh, golden record with my goals was to go to all the places in the world that I could uh, where we had golden record photographs. And I was actually in the Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula, and I was scuba diving in the Red Sea. One of the pictures we have on the golden record is a scuba diver in the Red Sea, and I wanted... Uh, I actually found the dive master who took that photographer on the dive, and I asked him to take me to that same dive site. Uh, so while I was there, I called back to my home in Toronto, where I was living. And I was living in a, a kind of a house with a number of artists and uh, writers and interesting people. I rented a room there. And I remember I was on a payphone in Sharm El Sheikh, which is at the very bottom of the Sinai Peninsula, very remote. And I was on a payphone with a very bad connection to Toronto. And I was talking to my friend, and I heard barely through the static said, Carl Sagan wants you to come to Los Angeles right away to do a television show. And he didn't say any more than that. 
So it was a very mysterious kind of message. I assumed it was for that same show we had talked about. So, uh, you know, when Carl calls you, it was near the end of my trip anyway. So I came back to uh, the mainland and went practically straight out to Los Angeles and then began uh, over two years of working with Carl and Adrian and the rest of the team uh, on making Cosmos. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I didn't know this. So you actually had a project of uh, going through all the pictures in the golden record and recreating that. And uh, so this was a message. The, this golden record was supposed to be a, a message of, of what uh, humankind um, is doing on, on Earth. And you wanted to, to be you wanted to be humankind. <laughs> you wanted to do everything <laughs> that humans do. <laughs> Very well, if we send it into space, I thought I should see it. But I, th I think there's a, a very, a very nice um, moral here that uh, so even before Cosmos, there were at least two failed projects that you mentioned that Carl wanted to do. So I think this is a valuable lesson, especially for our younger viewers, that um, failure is part of life, and and sometimes you have projects that you unfortunately can't. Uh, see them through uh, to a successful conclusion. And, and even um, even Cosmos was preceded by other failed projects. So one should not be discouraged by failure, but uh, on the contrary, use it as a learning experience to to do something better um, in, the, in the next one. Um, in Cosmos, one of the things that are more memorable, I think, was the shape of the imagination. Um, and I think it was really brilliant because the, the shape of the imagination in Cosmos, it doesn't look anything like, like anything that had been made before uh, in television or movies, the inside or the outside of the shape. And, and in fact, it doesn't even look like anything that has been done uh, ever since. So to me, this is a signature of a classic. Uh, something that is timeless. You, you see it now, and it doesn't it doesn't feel dated or obsolete because it's not it's not like you know like the ships in Star Trek or or Star Wars. It was something completely different. Um, can you uh, tell us a little bit about how the uh, ship of the imagination was uh, conceived? The spaceship of the imagination was the idea of Adrian Malone, the series producer. Uh, Carl originally thought that he would just be in standing in a studio or perhaps voiceover for most of it. But Adrian thought that it was very important that Carl actually be in space because if Carl was in space, it would allow the viewer to imagine that they were in space as well. But from the very beginning, uh, first of all, we knew we didn't have the budget to do anything like Star Wars. Uh, Cosmos was made uh, after the first Star Wars film was out, and while the second film, The uh, Empire Strikes Back, was in production. In fact, one of the special effects contractors that we worked with were, won an Oscar for the effects on Star Wars. And they knew how much those models cost and how much that kind of uh, photography cost. And it was simply beyond our means. Beyond that, uh, Carl didn't want to be competing with Star Trek. He didn't want people to compare his spaceship with a Star Trek spaceship or the Star Wars spaceship. The first Star Trek movie was also in production. And again, we knew that they had a budget that was far more than ours. So we had to find a, a solution. And the exterior of the spaceship uh, came about from a painting that I did, which kind of showed a dandelion in space. It imagined a cluster of stars, like the head of a dandelion, and the seeds drifting off into space. And Carl liked that painting and said that that's how the spaceship should be. So from the outside, the spaceship looks almost like a piece of dandelion fluff blowing through the cosmos. And the interior of the spaceship was designed by the art director at KCET, the uh, television station where we produced the series, John Retzik. He designed the interior. 
And the main constraint on that was uh, Adrian wanted Carl to have a big window in the spaceship where he could see the galaxies and the stars and the nebulae. Uh, but Carl was not an actor. And the normal way you would do this was have Carl looking at a blue screen and then you'd put the animation on it later. But Adrian was afraid that Carl would not be able to uh, react uh, to a blue screen the way he would if he uh, saw the real effects. So the screen was actually a projection screen and the effects were uh, rear projected. That is the projector was behind instead of in front of the screen projecting the animation onto the screen so Carl could really see it. That also meant that when Carl was in the studio doing the uh, shooting, we couldn't let him see any of the animation ahead of time so that his reaction would be as if he were seeing it for the first time. That also meant we had to hope that he would like it because uh, if he didn't like it, then his reaction would not be so good. But he had a lot of trust in me and the wonderful team of artists that I worked with in uh, making all the uh, projections on the screen. So, uh, but that was technology of the time, both in terms of projecting, rear projection, and also in terms of the cameras that could record it because the light level, the other thing Adrian wanted was that the light level in the ship be very dark, be very dim. So we were using the, really the newest cameras that could film in those very low light levels. So technically it was a very, very complicated uh, uh, job to make that spaceship. But as you say, I think it had a look of its own and a look that was not a high tech look because nothing dates faster than high tech. If you look at even the older tech movies and you look at the instrument panels, just the way the switches are, they're like switches were in the 80s, not like switches are now. So the technology of those things dates, whereas the technology or lack of technology in Carl's spaceship, I think, uh, endures. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned um, the special effects. Uh, of course, there were no uh, digital effects back then. And uh, one of the things that we have here in the, in the exhibition uh, which I think is absolutely fascinating, is those um, those uh, acetate sheets that that you sent us um, with the that were used to to produce the sequence of the the animation of the the approach to the Milky Way galaxy, and I, I find that uh, absolutely fascinating. Can you can you explain how these work? How those were uh, uh, employed to make these special effects? Yes. Cosmos was the last big project done before computers really entered the world of uh, animation and graphics. So we did use computer graphics in Cosmos. We worked with uh, the computer graphics lab at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which was one of the facilities in the late 1970s that was inventing what we now think of as CGI. And in fact, they did some sequences for Cosmos, and they're some of the best sequences, I think, especially the sequence showing the evolution of humans from simple cells, which was the very first use of what is now morphing technology that's used uh, everywhere in CGI. But except for that, all of the effects were done uh, in old-fashioned ways by making actual models or surfaces of Mars and Titan uh, were, and Venus were actual plasters that we built and painted. Uh, and the flying through the universe was all done the same way that uh, Walt Disney made Snow White by painting on clear sheets of plastic, uh, a plaster called acetate, with uh, special paints that stick to the acetate. And uh, in order to have a three-dimensional sense uh, in the animation, Disney invented something called multiplane, where you do different parts of the art on different acetates, and they can move separately, and that can give an, uh, uh, an illusion of, uh, of so this is So this is what we did. In the case of a galaxy or any other object, you had to imagine, let's say we were going to 
try to envision something that's in three dimensions. You would have to uh, take slices through it as if you were slicing the object and uh, paint on each acetate what was on each slice. Ideally, then, you would stack the acetate sheets all up together so when you looked through them, you were seeing all three dimensions. And if you moved the camera, each it would move a little bit differently, and that would give a three-dimensional effect. The problem was you can only shoot those pieces of acetate one at a time. It's impossible to put them together and light them so that they look uh, like they're supposed to. So what our team had to do was put up each acetate, make the camera move, which might be a 10 or 15 second move, and then rewind the film, replace the acetate with the next sheet, and do the same move all over again, making a double, triple, quadruple exposure on the same piece of <clears throat> That meant if on the seventh or eighth piece of acetate you made a mistake, you had to go back and start over. So it was very, very demanding. And our team, led by uh, Don Davis and John Allison and uh, Rick Sternback uh, and some other people, managed to do all of that uh, very, very difficult animation filming. And, uh, and it worked. But when I, uh, when I explain this method to the current generation of computer animators, I feel like I was the on a uh, clipper ship, an old-time sailing ship, such as the kind I know you now have in Spain to train your naval cadets. And that kind of sailing is wonderful. It's very romantic. But except for special cases like training ships, nobody sails that way anymore. Everybody uses engines because it's just better. It's faster. It's more reliable. So the way we did it in Cosmos was like the old time sailing ships. It's a technology that's gone. Nobody does it that way anymore. And we were really the last project to use uh, that technology. So I like to think that we sent it out with a bang. <laughs> that's, that's very remarkable. I, I wasn't aware of the fact that you would be shooting one by one. Um, and and not, not just combining, but using actually the same film to, to get them all um, together. We have them on display here, um, yeah, not all of them, uh, but a selection of eight of them, I believe. Um, so there's, there's a light shining from behind, and then you can see from the front um, how it sort of looks uh, 3D-ish if you, if you move a little bit, or you can even move the, the sheets a little bit. But of course, it doesn't, it doesn't look real because it has to be precisely calculated and moved. And, and we still have to fine tune it a little bit. We have to place them in the, um, in the correct order because we, are, we didn't put all of them. So one will have to very carefully put them in the right place and move them at the exact uh, rate uh, in order to, to get it right. But still, even if you don't I mean, I even if it's, it's not the, the perfect effect, but at least people can, can see the trick. They can see how it's done. So, so from, from yes. that point of view, I really, I really love it. And, and to think that they were shot one by one, these 14 sequences, and each one had to be moved differently, and you, you shoot them on the same film is, is really uh, amazing. It makes you uh, put into perspective the sheer amount of work that, that these uh, special effects uh, involved. Yeah, they were they were sleeping next to the, they were sleeping next to the camera. Sometimes it was very very long hours and very very difficult. So they did a great job. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, moving on. Um, le let's also talk a little bit uh, about uh, your career more specifically as a space artist, um, because one one of the main themes that I I seem to have noticed is that you are very much interested in in our own galaxy the milky way and painting the the milky way in the most realistic mm, way possible um and actually in cosmos is one of the most iconic sequences is the approach to the milky way 
um, which I believe you painted uh, the, the illustrations for that scene. Um, yes. So I, I wonder if that was an inspiration that sort of got you thinking about this problem of what our galaxy actually looks like from outside or, or the other way around, that, that maybe you were already interested in this problem and, and, and that's why you, um, you, you did this work in Cosmos, um, um, more motivated. What, what, what is your, the, the driving force between your interest in, in these uh, portraits of the Milky Way? Well, Yo-Yo Ma was born to play the cello and Pele was born to play soccer. And I think I was born to paint galaxies. I first saw a picture of a beautiful spiral galaxy, M81, when I was about eight years old. And I couldn't believe that it was real. I couldn't believe there was anything in the world, in the universe, so beautiful. And that feeling never left me. And when I started doing art, it was the subject that I found myself uh, drawn to. And in fact, one of the first pieces I did for Carl Sagan was I built a galaxy for his living room. I had invented a technique actually very similar to the multiplane technique. Uh, but instead of using acetate sheets, I used pieces of glass and I painted uh, parts of the galaxy on different planets with light that would glow ultraviolet, under ultraviolet light. So in a dark room, it looked like you were looking across the galaxy. And I built a model uh, like this for a science center in uh, Ontario. And Carl saw it and he loved it. And he asked me if I would make one for his living room in his home in Ithaca. And I did, and we had many, many conversations in front of that galaxy. It's still there. It's still in his home there. And uh, the Golden Record and Cosmos and uh, other projects, the TV projects that didn't happen, we talked about in front of that, uh, that galaxy. So uh, when I formed the team that did the artwork for Cosmos, and I was assigning different artists certain areas. For example, Don Davis, who probably knows more about Mars than any other artist in the world. Uh, I put in charge of all the Mars models and the Mars art. But the galaxy, I reserved for myself. I did the pictures of the Milky Way uh, in, in Cosmos. And as you say, that particular one has become, I would say, the iconic image of the series. For me, there are three things that everyone should know. You live on a planet, planet Earth. Everybody knows that. You live in a solar system with other planets and the sun is at the center. Everybody knows that. But your solar system is part of the Milky Way galaxy. Almost nobody knows that. And part of my mission in life has been to educate people about what the Milky Way is and where they are in it. And I've done it in many mediums, in the multiplane medium, uh, as a big mural for the Air and Space Museum in Washington. Uh, and copies of that, I think, are also in the exhibition. And then uh, maybe the largest galaxy work is the Galaxy Garden, which is a a uh, three-dimensional model of the galaxy done as a 30-meter diameter flower garden that's mapped in the shape of the spiral arms of our galaxy with uh, dots on the leaves of the plants representing the stars. And when you go to the leaf where our sun is, you see that nearly all the other stars we can see in the sky at night are on that same leaf. When you look up in the in the sky and you see, you think you're seeing out into the universe. Well, mostly what you're seeing is on Earth. And then you turn your head and see the rest of the galaxy garden. And it just teaches everybody the, the real scale of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another galaxy garden. Uh, actually, there are several more. The first one I built here in Hawaii near my home. But there's another one in Delaware in the United States. And then there's one in Spain in Pamplona, outside the planetarium. There's a beautiful galaxy garden that uh, I hope anybody in Spain can someday visit. 
Yes, I would like to encourage um, uh, everyone here to visit that uh, galaxy garden in Pamplona, in the Planetario de Pamplona. Uh, there's actually a bush there that, uh, that has the name of this museum uh, in it. So, so we are represented uh, in that uh, galaxy garden in a way. But your interest in, in galaxies, and our galaxy in particular, I think it transcends uh, the, the mere beauty of galaxies because you seem to be very interested in a realistic representation to the point that you've been following the latest scientific developments. I know that you have worked with my colleague and friend, uh, David Martinez Delgado, who uh, works on studying um, what happens when galaxies interact and merge with each other and things like that. And uh, he has been working um, in the past few years and uh, discovering, basically, he's been one of the, the people who have discovered new features of our galaxy that were unknown before, such as um, tidal streams uh, of stars that are the, the remnants of past uh, mergers of, uh, of our galaxy as it devoured uh, other, other galaxies around. And you were very interested in that work. Um, you somehow, I don't know uh, how that happened, but you, you got in contact with David and you've been working together. You've been incorporating those elements into your um, portraits of the Milky Way galaxy. And, and at the same time, uh, you've been illustrating uh, David's um, press releases and, and, uh, and illustrations uh, about his work. Um, so I'm curious about uh, this, this whole story. And, and by the way, if anybody's interested in these things that we are mentioning and, and John's work, I don't know if, if I mentioned that he has a website, uh, johnlomberg.com, where you can uh, appreciate all of these works and these galaxy portraits that I've been, um, that I've been talking about. Um, so uh, this, this uh, story, so you are interested also in, in getting uh, up to date with the latest scientific developments and discoveries and incorporating that into your por portraits, right? Well, I'm sure Degas knew a lot about ballet and uh, you kind of have to, if you take a subject and you really are interested in doing it right, you're just, you want to find out about as much about it as you can. And artists have always been inspired by nature. You know, there's some artists who find the sea uh, a source of inspiration or flowers the source of inspiration. And they may spend a whole career just being uh, painters of the sea. So I feel that it's not unusual for an artist to find one aspect of nature that, uh, that really calls out. And for me, that happened to be the key. And I've always loved the science of astronomy and have had a parallel career as a science writer and science journalist. So I just got into the habit of wanting to learn more and wanting to ask questions. And uh, the most wonderful thing about my career has been the opportunity to work with scientists, not only Carl Sagan, but Frank Drake and many others, including uh, uh, David Martinez Delgado, who asked me to make an image of one of his earlier discoveries of a, a dwarf galaxy on the far side of the Milky Way. And we became friends. And I love hearing about his important work discovering a whole new phenomena that's important in the evolution of galaxies that we just didn't know about before. <clears throat> uh, that's one of the really exciting things about being an astronomy artist you get to be the first person to learn about these things. I mean, if you want to paint the sea or want to paint flowers, you're competing with every other artist that has ever painted the sea and flowers. But if you're painting galaxies or tidal star streams, you may be the first artist to ever attempt it. So uh, you're really a pioneer, and that's very exciting as well. Plus, I just worry of galaxies, and uh, to me, there's nothing vaster. And beyond the galaxy, it's hard for me to think. I get lost. But within the galaxy, I really feel that's our home. I feel that I'm a citizen of the galaxy. And I feel that that's the perspective that Cos Carl wanted to portray in Cosmos, that we are all citizens of the galaxy. And that the galaxy is right here. We are all astronauts. You don't have to get in a rocket to go into space, to go into the galaxy. You're in the galaxy right now. All you have to do is realize it. And what I hope 
that work does is help people to realize it. Hmm. Um, I, I have many more questions, but I, th I think I'll ask you one last before we, uh, we open the um, session for questions from the audience. Um, I would like to invite our viewers online, if they have any questions for John, uh, to please uh, um, ask your, uh, formulate <coughs> your questions in the chat and, and we'll select, um, if, if there are questions for John, we'll select uh, some of them. Um, but before we, we go into that, let me ask you something about contact. Um, I think to remember that, um, I don't know if you mentioned this to me or I read it somewhere, that um, initially the the project um, was well th in the initial project there was more special effects and, and there were more sequences in space and there was more work for a space artist uh, than after well uh, I think that there was a change of director or something like that and then it was um, they decided to take a different direction and minimize the number of uh, sequences in space in this movie. Um, can you explain this? The first director for Contact was George Miller, who had done Babe and the Mad Max movies. Mm. And uh, I remember going to a uh, three-day creative brainstorming session with him and uh, Carl and some of the other people in uh, California and uh, George Miller loved space, he loved science fiction, and in his treatment of it, uh, there was actually quite a lot that happened in space. But then for various reasons, he was replaced with Robert Zemeckis, who had done the Back to the Future movies. And Zemeckis didn't really want to make a movie about space. He was interested in the story of the, the woman trying to realize her dream. But he was afraid that people had seen enough of space in the Star Wars and Star Trek movies. So Carl said to me, John, your job is to convince him that space is worth showing. So I had to do some uh, concept pictures that showed that there was a lot more in space than people had seen in Star Trek or Star Wars. Uh, but he still wanted to set most of the story on Earth. So the compromise we reached was that he would open the movie with a big space scene, give people their, uh, their dose of space. The people who had come to see a Carl Sagan movie and they wanted to see space, right off the top, they'd see the best space scene they ever saw. And then Zemeckis could get back to telling the story he wanted to do. And then you don't get back in space again for almost two hours. <clears throat> and even then the scenes are much briefer than I think they might have been if Carl had been healthy and able to uh, participate in the uh, creative discussions. But that scene that we did was the opening sequence of Contact, which in a way was almost a redo, the opening cosmic zoom in the cosmos, where we started from the edge of the universe and ended up at Earth. In Contact, we started at Earth, and this time entirely in CGI, uh, pulled back to the edge of the universe. Uh, and I designed that sequence. I said that if it was a house, I was the architect. And then Sony Imageworks and Culver City were the uh, construction contractors who actually made it. So in a way, uh, that sequence, uh, which seems to have been well received and a lot of people like it, was uh, the best we were able to do with space. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And th there is also another interesting story about that second sequence, uh, the, the one with the, the wormholes. Um, because initially, you, uh, um, uh, well, Carl um, sought um, counsel from Kip Thorne, who was the leading expert in, uh, in, these, uh, uh, in the physics of wormholes and, and black holes. In fact, I believe initially Carl's idea was to have a black hole when he wrote the novel uh, for the interstellar travel and then um, Kip Thorne, when, when he read the first draft, um, called uh, Carl and told him to uh, not use a black hole, that that was not the right tool to accomplish what he was uh, trying to do, but instead um, use a wormhole 
which is something that Kip Thorne was uh, developing the theory and the mathematics of, of wormholes in general relativity at the time. And then um, for the movie, I think you guys were in contact with Kip Thorne and he gave you some advice for those um, scenes with the, with the wormhole. And, uh, but I think uh, uh, Zemeckis was not very amenable to, to the idea, right? Was, was it something like that? with Kip Thorne at Caltech about the sequences of the movies where there's the wormhole. And the very first thing Kip Thorne said to me is, I don't know how much power you have on this movie, but whatever you do, don't make it look like water going down a drain. That's how everybody does a black hole to show the accretion disk and the material swirling in, like it's something swirling and going down. He said, don't make it look like that. And I said, well, what does it look like? He said, well, I don't really know, but uh, I'm going to assign you to work with one of my grad students who's going to figure it out. So I spent a couple weeks working with uh, one of the students who was actually tracing the paths of photons would take in a wormhole. And we came out with a very interesting look. It's almost as if you look at the, uh, the backside of a spoon. In other words, it wouldn't look like a hole. It would look like a bubble. It would look like something coming out at you, not like something going in. And what you would see on that surface was the other side of the wormhole, but distorted in a funny way. And I thought, well, that could look really interesting. Certainly not, not like anything anybody ever saw. So I did some images that Kip liked and his student liked. And then when we had our production meeting where I had to show to the uh, special effects producer and uh, the director, Robert Zemeckis, they looked and said, yeah, that's, that's interesting, that's really weird looking, that's, that's kind of cool, but what we really wanted it to look like was water going down a drain. So <laughs> they did exactly what Kip Thorne told them not to do, and again, at that time, Carl was very ill and was not able to get into that level of detailed uh, discussion. So the wormhole sequence in contact is uh, not satisfactory, but, at least Kip Thorne had a chance to try to do it again more to his satisfaction movie, Interstellar. Hmm. It's interesting. You mentioned earlier that as, a, as an artist, you can, um, by being in touch with the science, uh, you can hope to be a pioneer by being the first one to, to picture something. I wonder if you feel that you lost an opportunity to be the pioneer in representing a realistic wormhole in contact, um, which uh, then happened later in Interstellar. Are you a bit bitter uh, about that? <laughs> no, not at all. You have to have a thick skin. The difference between movies and television and painting is that in a painting, I have total control over it. I think it up, I make all the decisions, every decision I make and I do it, and then people either like it or not. But when you work with television and film, you're working with a lot of other people. And it can't just be what you want. And there are many factors that people are worried about, costs and office and audience reaction and similarity to other movies and uh, many, many factors. So I had my role. All I could do was make my suggestion. And uh, it happened many times in Cosmos that there were sequences I we wanted to have that we couldn't shoot. I think some of the best sequences in Cosmos were the ones that we didn't shoot. Uh, but you just get used to it and you learn to be happy with what you do achieve. Because as you said before, most things don't succeed. I mean, here in uh, America, our big sport is baseball. And if a batter can get a hit one third of the time, he's considered a champion. So on that level, you know, one out of three is considered great. So I just look at what we managed to achieve and I'm happy about that. Very good. Okay, so at this point, uh, I would like to know if anybody here at the museum has any questions. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot be handing the microphone around uh, because of the uh, health regulations. Uh, so you will have to uh, tell me the question and I will repeat it for, uh, for John and for the, the people watching over the internet. Does anybody have any question or any comment for, for John? Uh, no questions in, in Spanish or in English, in Espanol, si quieren, yo la traduzco. Um, uh, 
no questions. Um, then I'm going to uh, take the, the chance to ask you about the TMT to close this interview, which is, let me just give a, a little bit of background for our, um, our audience. The TMT is the 30 meter telescope. It's one of the, um, one of the large uh, telescopes that are uh, being built. And uh, it's just to give you an idea, the largest telescope right now, uh, optical telescope in the world, is, uh, is here in the Canary Islands on the island of La Palma. This is the GTC telescope. It's, it's 10 meters uh, in diameter. So now there's projects for, there's three projects for 30 and 40 meter telescopes. So that's, that's really huge telescopes. And uh, two of them are being built on Chile. And the third one is a TMT which uh, is uh, the project I uh, wanted to build in Hawaii, uh, very close to where John lives. And um, the problem is that uh, some people feel that there's already too many telescopes on the Hawaiian mountains, and, uh, and that um, maybe it's not a good idea to build another one uh, of this scale. And so uh, there's been some tensions there. And the backup site will be here in the Canary Islands, uh, also on the island of La Palma. So we are following uh, this very closely, of course. Uh, my institute, the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias, is, um, is of course, uh, very, very interested and, and would love to, to host uh, this, uh, this telescope. And I know that John has been uh, um, very vocal in supporting the, uh, the indigenous communities who are leading the opposition to the construction of the TMT in Hawaii. So I don't know if you wanted to mention something about that, or what's, if you want to give us an update of what's the situation there, um, because there were protests uh, last year. I don't know if the situation is now more calm. Uh, there seems to be some kind of a, a truce uh, because of the COVID-19 situation. What is the, the situation now? The situation currently with the TMT is that everything has been halted because of the pandemic. But even before the pandemic, everything had been halted. I think the TMT is a wonderful telescope. I love astronomy and I love the idea of these very big telescopes. And I would love it if the TMT could have been placed in Hawaii. But what happened was for a variety of reasons, none of which I would say are anti-science. I mean, the Hawaiians have very graciously permitted the construction of, uh, at the high point, 13 observatories on the mountain that they own and that they consider sacred. And there have been many issues uh, about the relations between the astronomy community and the local community, ranging from issues about uh, access to the mountain uh, and who controls the access, things like that. Uh, if the community in Hawaii had wanted the TMT built here, I think it would have been great to build it here. But what happened was uh, when the construction started, there was a large, sustained, and massively su supported protest by Hawaiian people and other people who felt that the process by which the TMT had been, uh, who had been flawed and that there were many reasons that they did not want that construction to go ahead. Uh, the opposition was so large, so sustained, so uh, uh, various in terms of how many people were participating and the support they got from other indigenous peoples around the world, that it was clear that the, uh, there was a large section of the community here that did not want it. And uh, my feeling was the same. Uh, and I, I even took the uh, liberty of imagining how I think Carl responded. Because Carl and I talked about a similar project, a spaceport that was proposed on the island of Hawaii back in 1987 when I first moved here. And Carl was visiting me here. And I knew he would be asked about the spaceport. And I encouraged him to read up on it. And his final feeling about it was, it's a great idea, but only if the community wants it. Ultimately, even though you can say the world benefits from it, you're putting it in somebody's community, and that community has to want it. And I think it's very clear that enough of the community here doesn't want it, that uh, 
even though I love astronomy, I love telescopes, you know, you, you have to be welcome, especially when you're a guest. It's not, a, it's not land that you own. You're there on somebody else's uh, permission, and they've already given you a lot of permission, so it's not as if the Hawaiians have been anti-astronomy. It's this particular project for various reasons about the way it has been conducted. I don't believe it will ever be built in Hawaii. Uh, so therefore, what's the point of having a plan B if you don't use it? I very much hope that the TMT will decide to build uh, in Tenerife. I look forward to visiting it. I hope so. You'll be most welcome here. Um, thank you for your comments. Let me just very quickly, uh, to, to finish this interview, read uh, a few comments from some of the people who have been watching. Like uh, uh, Julia Moreno, she says, uh, Dear John, what a fantastic uh, art life. Thank you. In your words, I can see your passion for, for your work. In, in your words, I can see your passion for your work. Congratulations. Ismael, Thank you. Ismael Perez de Tudela says, I have always wondered how Cosmos could be so influential in so many people, and I'm figuring out in this interview. It was done by the greatest humanist, and that connects us, and it underlined everything. Um, Cohen Lia says, I love the citizen of the galaxy idea. Israel Perez de Tudela again says, question for John, uh, what is in Cosmos uh, to do it so international? How can a TV program connect and unite people around the world to feel like one civilization? And, th and then he goes on and says, it is an amazing feeling now to know that everybody feels the same when they watch Cosmos in a world in which it seems that the most important is to be different from the others. I think that's a profound and wonderful comment. Well, um, that's pretty much our time uh, tonight. Um, John, mahalo. It's been a real pleasure having you here. De nada. <laughs> um, yeah, John speaks a little bit of Spanish. Uh, so I didn't think about that. We could have done this interview in Spanish probably. <laughs> ¿Verdad? Hubiera estado bien. No. <laughs> anyway, uh, join us next week. Uh, same place, same time. We will be talking with uh, Carolina Jimenez, who is um, uh, she's another type of artist. She works on digital effects, and she has worked on the recent um, uh, Cosmos Seasons by Neil deGrasse Tyson, and she's a huge fan of the uh, original uh, Cosmos. And so she's going to, um, to tell us about special effects, how they were done 40 years ago, how they are done now, and they can tell us a little bit about how they are done in the, in the new cosmos. Um, so I hope to, to see you again next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.